Um, this is the Greenway NAC meeting, and we'll do a quick round of introductions. I'll just call on you, um, and then we'll get started on the agenda. So I'm Miles Glowacki. I'm the Neighborhood Program Coordinator for the city. Uh, Mr. Barton. Uh, good evening. My name is Kevin Barton. I'm the District Attorney in Washington County. Thank you. Uh, David. Hi, I'm uh, David Marciniak with the Willamette Water Supply Program. Wendy. Hi, I'm Wendy Kroger and I'm on the Greenway NAC. Stacy. Stacy Reve, City of Beaverton, a Public Works Engineering Capital Project Outreach. Um, Officer Klein. Yeah, I'm Officer Matthew Klein with the Beaverton Police Department representing Beaverton for this NAC meeting. Thanks for having me. Um, let's see, Catherine. Yes, hi, I'm Catherine Ellis, representative from the Tualatin Hills Park and Recreation District. Joan. I'm Joan Miller. I'm a resident in Greenway. Great, thank you. Rhonda. I am Rhonda. I am the recorder for the Greenway NAC. Thanks, Rhonda. Um, Kevin. Hi, I'm Kevin Pallad. I'm the code compliance officer that services the Greenway National City of Utah. Uh, and James. Hello, uh, my name is James Terwilliger. I'm a resident in the uh, Greenway NAC and I am uh, here to possibly be looking to be appointed to the alternate position to BCCI. Great, thank you, James. And Sonny. Hi, uh, my name is Sonny Mehta. I'm Brian Decker's uh, campaign manager, and um, I am not Brian Decker, although uh, there are times when I knock on doors um, in Washington County and people just assume with a mask and glasses that we're the same person, but Brian doesn't wear cool shirts like I do. So <laughs> thank you for having us, or me. Thank you. Take care, Brian. Okay, um, next on the agenda is the Washington County District Attorney candidates. Uh, we have uh, District Attorney Kevin Barton here and the challenger Brian Decker, um, who Sonny is filling in for. And you each have 10 minutes. And um, Mr. Barton, would you like to go first? You know, I'll let Sonny go first, uh, but thank you. Okay, Sonny, would um, oh, there you are. You jumped around on my screen, sorry. You have uh, 10 minutes. Um, does that include uh, time for questions? It does, yeah. Great. <laughs> well, uh, my name is Sunny Mehta. Um, I grew up in Beaverton, um, graduated Southridge High School, and I am really excited to be here representing Brian. I will try and do my best. Um, um, but uh, Brian is a former federal prosecutor in the Obama administration. Um, and has been a public defender in uh, Washington County for the last four years. Um, he grew up the child of a single mother, um, and um, as a prosecutor in the Obama administration, worked to take illegal guns off of our streets, and as a public defender, worked to ensure that those who can't afford legal counsel um, are still provided with a strong defense. Um, Brian's been endorsed by uh, Mayor Lacey Beatty, um, Metro Councilor, Metro Council President Lynn Peterson, and uh, Council, uh, Council Metro Councilors Garrett Rosenthal and uh, Juan Carlos Gonzalez, um, including uh, city councilors like Mar Mariana Valenz Valenzuela um, in Forest Grove, uh, former uh, mayor of Hillsboro, uh, Tom Hughes, um, and former council president of Hillsboro, um, uh, Fred Noctegal, um, and um, all the way from Sherwood to uh, King City to Banks, um, city councilors, um, and a couple mayors have endorsed um, and one former uh, mayor have endorsed Brian's campaign, um, including uh, organizations like the Washington County Democratic Party, the Independent Party of Oregon, uh, the Beaverton Education Association, and Washington County Uniserve, um, Northwest Oregon Labor Council, AFL-CIO, uh, United Food and Commercial Workers, Pro-Choice Oregon, PAC, um, Basic Rights Oregon, um, PAC, um, Asian American Pacific Islander Network of Oregon, Latino Network Action Fund, uh, PECUN, the Farm Workers Union, 
Safety and Justice Oregon PAC, uh, the Working Families Party. Um, um, you should go to deckerforda.com uh, slash um, team dash Decker to check out our full list of endorsers because there are a lot. Um, and um, uh, I'm uh, uh, I'm glad to be here and representing Brian because I frequently get frustrated as a campaign manager when he doesn't mention uh, all the good folks that have endorsed his campaign. Um, um, but uh, Brian is running to prioritize prevention. The status quo isn't working. Addiction, mental health, uh, mental illness, and poverty are the main drivers of crime, and we need real smart public. Uh, real smart public safety means addressing issues before crime happens, not just reacting after the fact. Um, serving victims, um, those who have been harmed by crime, deserve a voice in the criminal justice system. Um, true justice means listening to victims at all stages, and our current system doesn't serve many victims and survivors of crime well, um, and we can't just accept uh, more of the same. Um, it's time for a change. Um, yeah. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions that folks have. Um, I will again, try and do my best. I am filling in for, uh, I'm filling in for Brian tonight because, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, DA Barton, um, our opponent has not declined the urban league, uh, debate. So, um, thankfully I'm available and can fill in as best as I can. So happy to answer any questions. Yeah, James, go ahead. Hello, uh, my apologies for the odd screen because uh, I had some network connection issues uh, on my computer, so I'm now in my handheld mode. Um, thank you for that introduction. I will admit that uh, you mentioned a lot of endorsements. I've been involved in enough local politics in the last few years to know that endorsements can sometimes be a measure of one's connectedness, not of one's approval. So I'm gonna ask a different question than that. And that is very specific, which is you mentioned that the status quo cannot hold. Can you please be much, much more specific than that? What is it that you expect your candidate to change if they get into office? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, well, you know, first off, I think, um, uh, transparency is key um, and having a more transparent process around and accountability around um, um, office charging decisions and um, a more collaborative approach with uh, regional uh, leaders and public safety are important um, to make sure um, that uh, we aren't just, um, you know, like we, <laughs> um, uh, uh, D.A. Barton, um, you know, told the Beaverton Valley Times that if you vote for him, you get more of the same. Um, but uh, what does more of the same look like? Well, gun violence is up, um, crime is up, um, and the approaches that um, uh, D.A. Barton respectfully have uh, taken, um, a hard, hard, tough on crime approach simply aren't working. So um, we need a collaborative approach. We need less obstruction when it comes to advocacy for a DA at the statewide level. Uh, we need more collaboration on um, the local front. Um, Brian has also been endorsed by uh, legislators like uh, Representative Winsvey Campos, um, State Senator Elizabeth Steiner Hayward, Representative uh, Prusak, um, Dacia Graber, um, among others. Um, and it's going to take uh, it's going to take a lot of different uh, folks at different levels of government to collaborate on um, making sure that we aren't just trying to solve crime after the fact. Um, and uh, Washington County voter, Washington County is getting a bad deal. Um, the budget for the DA's office has gone up and um, crime has gone up and this old approach just simply isn't working. Uh, Washington County has the highest, one of the highest recidivism rates in the state and has had, uh, is the highest recidivism rate in the metro area. Um, over 260 cases by the Oregon State Court of Appeals since DA Barton has been in office have been overturned. Um, and that is a waste of money. You should be getting it right from the get go. Um, and um, a lot of those, of some of those cases that were overturned were for prosecutorial misconduct, including a case involving um, DA Barton himself. Um, and um, that's a waste of money. We're re-traumatizing victims when we have to, when cases have to go back down through trial again. Um, and we have 
it's just it we can't that's the status quo basically And from what we found on knocking over 10,000 doors and talking to thousands of voters um, and engaging with um, community groups and uh, local leaders and business owners is that they want change overwhelmingly. Are there any other questions for Sonny? He's got a few minutes left in his time. James, did you have another question? I do, if that's okay, but if anybody else has one first, please, by all means, someone else should go first. I don't see anyone. Okay. Are the Twilliger curves named after you? I am related to them. The person uh -huh. for whom we're actually named after the same person. The uh -huh. Twilliger curves are named after the sixth person who arrived in Portland, who also happened to be the first blacksmith in town, by the name of James Terwilliger. And uh, he donated a bunch of land, which is why it's all after his name up there near OHSU. Um, so then my question following up is, um, if one's intent is to try to interject into the system before crime happens, how does one do that from the DA's office if a lot of the DA's purview is specifically related to er areas of the, the criminal system that are specifically after crime happens? Um, well, unfortunately, um, I can't, I, I'm, I won't answer on behalf of Brian for like specifics about after the fact, but um, what I will say is that um, DA Barton has consistently um, been an obstructionist um, when it comes to uh, statewide policy. So, I mean, just uh, like, I, I will speak on my own behalf and just, tell you that you know the uh, like there <laughs> um, DA Barton has been spearheading a um, conservative right-wing approach tough on crime approach at the legislative level instead of uh, actually working on solving challenges and working to address systemic issues like for example um, the public defense crisis that Oregon has right now. I mean, it's outrageous. But, um, I mean, you know, in, in, in the position that DA Barton has had, has could have been lobbying for change at the state level and working with the Oregon District Attorneys Association to accomplish change and has, and has been advocating against policies that would move us forward. Has not, honestly, the campaign rhetoric I've seen regarding Measure 110 and the treatment measure for um, uh, drug addiction um, has been obstruction. And there's a ton of money sitting at OHA that hasn't been distributed yet. And, um, you know, honestly, everything that I've seen, that I've seen discussed about in terms of- uh, so, um, you know, I, gotta, I gotta cut in there. Um, yeah. your, ten, your 10 minutes are up, so. Okay. We have to make sure that there's equal time. So thank you. Thank you for your comments and for being here. Um, Kevin, would you like to go? You have 10 minutes. Uh, yeah, that'd be great. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you all for having me. I'm going to respond to a lot of the statements and accusations uh, that Sonny made uh, in a moment, but I want to first tell you a little bit about me. And, and I'll preface it by saying I disagree with everything he said. So let me start first with who I am. I am your current district attorney in Washington County. Uh, I have uh, served in the Washington County DA's office for the last 15 years, the last four of which as the elected DA. And the mission of the DA is really simple. It's to keep you safe. Uh, and as your DA, um, I believe we have done just that. Washington County is the safest large county in Oregon. And if you look at our combined property crime and violent crime statistics, the crime rates, uh, it will show that not only are we the safest large county, we're 30% lower than the state average and 50% lower than the crime rate that is in neighboring Multnomah County. I was elected in 2018. Uh, and at that time, uh, I beat my opponent by over 40 points. And I ran on the same promise then that I'm running on now, which is to do things like prosecuting criminals, protecting victims, and pursuing responsible reforms. And I've done just that in my four years. So some of the 
important and big things that we've done in the DA's office, aside from keeping the county safe, as we've gone through a difficult last four years. Uh, but some of the big reforms and changes that we've made have been things like establishing a veterans treatment court, which is a specialty court program for veterans uh, dealing with addiction or mental health issues. We've established two different mental health courts uh, to deal with people who are uh, suffering from mental health issues, a domestic violence prosecution team, which our county never had. Um, we've established a, uh, a cold case unit to go back and uh, try and solve old unsolved sex cases and homicide cases going back to the 70s. Um, a county-based uh, hate crimes team, the first and only one in the state that we actually funded using a federal grant. Uh, we um, established and are working to build what's called a family peace center, which is uh, to serve uh, both children and adults who are dealing with trauma. So things like child abuse and domestic violence uh, to address something called ACEs, which is uh, trauma that kids have when they're younger. It stands for adverse childhood experiences. The idea is if we do more for younger people when they're younger. Uh, hopefully uh, we'll have to have, we'll see them less in the criminal justice system when they're older. Um, and we established a couple of years ago, Oregon's first and only diversity legal job fair to help diversify the employees, not just at the DA's office, but in the entire legal community um, uh, that, that serves, you know, of course, the, the Washington County community. So those are just some of the things we've done in the last four years uh, alongside, as I said, our core mission, which is keeping people safe. Um, when it comes to running for re-election, you know, it might just be one name on the ballot. Uh, or one name on the yard sign, but a uh, lesson I learned very early on is uh, no person is an island and you cannot and do not do this by yourself. So um, I'll tell you who some of my endorsements are and you'll notice there's a very different type of list that I have than my opponent has. My list is not a political list. Uh, it's not a all one side, uh, all one party type list. It's, it's a very big mixture of people throughout the county in different, different areas of the county. And here's who they are. Uh, it's our elected sheriff, Pat Garrett. Uh, it's every single police chief in the county from every city with a police department in the county. Every single police officers association. So those are the associations that represent the first responders, uh, uh, all the police officers throughout the county. It's 11 of our current and former mayors throughout the county. Um, it is um, Republicans and Democrats. So Republicans, Jerry Willie and Roy Rogers from the Washington County Commission. Uh, Democrats like former Commissioner Dick Scouten or uh, Representative Susan McLean, a Democrat, or even former uh, Governor Kulangoski have all endorsed me. Um, it's over 20 of our elected DAs throughout the state, uh, two of our former United States attorneys, uh, the federal prosecutors in the state, and it's business leaders. Uh, Tim Boyle of Columbia Sportswear, a major employer in Washington County, uh, Pat Reeser from Reeser's Fine Foods, um, the Washington County Chamber of Commerce, um, all of these people have endorsed me, and the reason is uh, I, I know them all. I have worked with them all. They know me. They know what I have done. And what I can tell you is the work of public safety requires partnerships like that to keep our county safe. So I'm very happy to have their support. We've got some big challenges in Washington County right now uh, that we're dealing with, public safety challenges and concerns about rising crime, especially property crime. Uh, and what we need is a leader who has the proven track record and experience to tackle those issues. Um, a big, big issue that I worry about is crime from Portland. And I can tell you in looking at the crime stats, it's definitely coming into Washington County. And I'll give you an anecdote. The Sherwood Chief, Chief of Police, who's a friend of mine, uh, his personal car was stolen in Sherwood twice uh, and found in Portland twice. And uh, the chances are, if your car is stolen or your catalytic converter is stolen, there's a good odd, good chance that it's coming from outside the county coming in. Uh, we're dealing with rising addiction here in the county, and a lot of that is driven by ballot measure 110, which decriminalized drug use. And according to recent news coverage in the Oregonian, it's total chaos, uh, according to one quote, because that law has not worked. Uh, and we need a DA who can help fix that issue. You know, under ballot measure 110 in the entire state, that ballot measure that promised more treatment, only 19 people last year, 19 for the whole state, actually followed through and re received treatment services as a result of ballot measure 110. Uh, and that stat that I just shared with you is in the Oregonian. You can read it yourself. 
Now, I want to talk about some of the things that uh, Mr. Mehta has said. He said that the current system doesn't serve victims of crime well. I beg to differ. Um, you know, I, as a prosecutor, I worked 10 years before I was elected as the DA as a child sex crimes prosecutor. And I have literally worked with victim after victim, uh, making sure that they get the justice they need. And it can't always work for everyone. There are times when the justice system absolutely doesn't, um, doesn't do everything for everyone. But I can tell you that our Washington County justice system does work well. Uh, and I think it can work even better with continued leadership. Um, another thing that I heard my opponent's campaign manager say is something about our office not being transparent and not being collaborative with law enforcement and public safety leaders. That's just not accurate. You know, I have strong working relationships with every chief of police and the sheriff in the county. The only public safety leader that actually supports my opponent uh, is a single police officer uh, who's on our office's Brady list for dishonesty. And it's the woman who ran unsuccessfully for sheriff uh, two years ago. Um, so my opponent, I believe, is a somewhat of a fringe candidate. The Pamplin editorial board um, just uh, released a uh, endorsement of me. And in their endorsement, uh, the Pamplin editorial board talked about how Mr. Decker has supported the defund police movement. Mr. Decker, my opponent, uh, he actually founded a nonprofit a couple of years ago that was dedicated to defunding the sheriff's office, defunding the DA's office, and abolishing Oregon's prison system. And when the Pamplin talked about that nonprofit, uh, they indicated that they believed that he connected himself to what they called a fringe ideology that had its 15 minutes of fame in 2020, but then was rightfully rejected by an overwhelming and bipartisan majority. And I just think that uh, that type of a fringe or extreme approach is not something that will keep Washington County safe. So I'd love to use my remaining time to answer any questions that you might have. And I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with all of you. Mr. Uh, Twilliger. I regret to feel like I may be uh, the one who's asking all the questions here on, on all of these. So please, if anybody else has any questions, uh, I, I assume I'm not the only one in the audience. Um, one thing that <laughs> one one thing that the previous uh, speaker also was mentioning was that if I'm going to extrapolate that the position of DA does exist in an ecosystem that the DA may be mostly in charge of things that have happened post the crime occurring, but that true safety, true everything is a, a holistic thing. And I'm, I must admit, I'm a little bit troubled by what you're saying about Measure 110. Now, I will admit I'm a recent replacement back to Beaverton. I grew up in Beaverton, but I've been living in Washington for the past 10 years. So I'm a little bit out of context. And so I apologize if I'm missing something. But generally speaking, my understanding is that the opposite of addiction is not sobriety, it is community. And so maybe Measure 110 was incomplete, but I'm worried about an approach that recriminalizes a behavior that that is still a symptom of something else and so i'm curious if you can comment on what you think the actual solution is to what's obviously a a, a crisis in the city that's an excellent question let me start by saying this uh before first of all what does measure 110 do measure 110 does many many things uh it's titled the treatment and rehabilitation act and it was overwhelmingly passed by the voters there's no doubt about that the voters spoke and it was passed i think when most people voted for 110 they thought that it would increase treatment opportunities in the community for people suffering from addiction uh that's what all the people all of my friends and neighbors who voted for it that's what they've told me and that's what the backers of 110 sold it as something that would increase treatment opportunities it did not do that unfortunately and it may one day do that down the road but in the meantime we have people who are quite literally dying from drug overdose and addiction issues unfortunately before 110 we had a bridge to treatment for these people and the bridge to treatment was the criminal justice system where if someone was using, uh, let's say heroin or meth, and they were seen by the police using that, uh, they would be arrested and prosecuted and forced to engage in drug treatment. They would be required to do that as a condition of their probation. They wouldn't be sent to prison, they wouldn't stay in jail, but they'd be required to participate in drug treatment as a condition of their probation. 
what we did was that was working so so it wasn't great there's no doubt about that the war on drugs was not going well but that was the bridge to treatment that we had what 110 did was it tore down that bridge but it failed to build an alternative bridge and that alternative bridge that it promised never materialized and now all the people that we were, were getting into treatment before 110 they're not getting it now now the backers of 110 will say well give us some time, it'll work in a year or two. But the problem is we have people that are literally suffering right now and dying. And so that's where I have the big problem. Before you tear something down, you need to build something up so you still have that bridge to treatment. And I think that's where 110 has failed. And the way to fix it is to get that treatment bridge built back up as quickly as we can. Kevin, I've got to cut you off. Um, that's all the time we have for, for this part of the agenda, so. Great. Thank you for the invitation, Miles. I appreciate it. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. Hi, Jim. You were able to get on on your phone, I bet. You're muted. Okay. I think I'm set. Can you hear me okay, Miles? Yep. Okay, I'm on my phone. I don't know. I used two different computers and they both couldn't get connect to Zoom and I don't know. And matter of fact, my phone couldn't until I disabled the wireless and made it use, uh, uh, you know, until uh, I disconnected the internet and then it, it's working on, you know, data from cell phones. So I had exactly the same problem. Me too. So, um, so anyway, I guess we can go ahead. I, I, my cell phone is my source of time and I can't see a time on it, but we'll go ahead. Uh, let's go ahead with, do we have a community police officer there? We do, yep. Okay, let's let him talk. Hi, it's, it's Officer Klein. Thanks for having me. Um, you know, as, as far as doing the, the uh, uh, standard uh, crime report, we, uh, we have seen a few uh, extra uh, thefts in our neighborhood. And again, you know, unfortunately it's, it's the catalytic converter thefts. It just, it's, um, plaguing our area. We've actually successfully, uh, caught several people doing it. Uh, the, the community, as far as people with their vigilance, being willing to speak out, get, getting a hold of us quickly. We've been able to, uh, arrest, uh, several of the, the folks that are stealing catalytic converters. Unfortunately, there's still a ton more uh, we are seeing people trickling at night from uh, from Portland, getting under cars and, and stealing the catalytic converters really quickly. But um, just uh, be mindful that if you can park inside your garage, uh, park in well lit areas, and uh, you know uh, a ton of like ring cameras and and uh, uh, outside lighting is is definitely helping fight that uh, kind of the, the plague that we have going on of catalytic converter thefts. Um, we also, I don't know if you've heard, uh, our uh, chief and deputy chief are uh, have announced their retirements. So, their uh, our deputy chief is already retired, and then our uh, our current chief uh, uh, in uh, it's coming up pretty quick. I think uh, in the beginning of May she's leaving. Well, we have an interim chief on hand, uh, Stacy Jepsum. So, we're uh, we're excited to see what uh, new leadership will bring. It's been incredible. Uh, serving under Chief Groshong. It's been amazing. And we're, we're all sad to see her leave, but we're excited for her uh, uh, future adventures. And uh, some more uh, good notes. Let's see, I've, I've got a list here. We've got, um, we just sent three recruit, new uh, police recruits to the Academy uh, Monday. So they just started. We actually have, let's see, um, we have six recruit officers that are currently going through our orientation training and they're going to hit the road with coaches uh, here pretty quick. Uh, and then um, uh, actually tonight we have some reserves and cadets uh, doing their training and they'll be graduating shortly. So they'll be out on the, the road. So it's just been really exciting to see a ton of new officers, uh, a lot of training going on, getting to have our uh, volunteers back in the building. It's just, it's really been amazing. And so um that's kind of some of the exciting things that are going on with the department. If uh, anybody has any questions.
I have a question about, um, I don't know, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can. Oh, okay. I have a question about how to prevent catalytic converter thefts other than parking in a garage when you don't have a garage. Right. I live in a condo with carports. Um, mm -hmm. I've heard some things like spray painting it with a heat resistant bright paint helps. How does that help? Well, so, uh, and, and I was actually talking with a coworker about this recently and said, I believe it was AT&T or a, a, a large uh, um, company that had a lot of thefts that were happening with their uh, company vehicles. So they, you spray paint the, uh, the catalytic converter uh, all over with a bright color and it basically labels it so you, you can't get the paint off. And so what they do is when they're trying to get it to, to sell or recycle or whatever, uh, people know that it's stolen. So basically, um, if we run into someone that's got these brightly painted catalytic converters, you know, it's, it's obviously it's stolen. Um, that, that's one method that people have been uh, trying to do. Does that really prevent or help prevent them being stolen? You know, I, I wouldn't know the statistics on it. I do know I did talk to one person uh, individually, and this is the only thing I could speak to. Um, she said that she had done that and they'd still cut her catalytic converter off. Um, I don't, I don't know how effective it is at been preventing it, but uh, uh, definitely um, with your, with the carports, if they're able to have motion sensor cameras, motion sensor lights, and um, you know, it's just, it's kind of more the deterrent, but uh, unfortunately, like I said, it, it's been, uh, a hard battle trying to prevent these crimes because they happen so fast. It takes just less than a minute for them to cut these uh, catalytic converters off. Uh, if you do hear noises like the sawzalls well, that yeah. they're using, yeah. So the 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 metal on metal noise and the sawing um, that's actually given uh, away people's uh, what what their intentions were and uh, have alerted car owners to call us and that and that's actually several arrests have been made just by people hearing that going on it and getting uh, the word out to us immediately. Okay, does it help? I've heard of these catalytic converter um, cages or covers. Does mm -hmm. that help? And I, you know, I haven't personally researched it, but I can imagine if they're uh, able to prevent a metal saw from cutting through and making it harder, that I, I could see that potentially being uh, effective. I haven't personally uh, researched or, or heard any success stories from anybody that have used them, but I, it, it sounds viable. I think possibly more viable than having the uh, catalytic converter painted. Okay. Do you um, mm -hmm. know of any resources for getting this done? I don't have the capability of doing it myself. Sure, uh, I, I don't. Like I said, I hadn't researched it, but uh, if I hear uh, anything, I'll, I, I can let you know. Okay. I might be actually of some help there. That was actually what I raised my hand for. Oh, I was perfect. Gonna okay. ask, Please. I was going to yeah. ask, ask the question about the, the cat shield. Uh, my mother is also a, a homeowner and resident in Greenway Knack. She recently got a cat shield installed. I can try to find out where she got that done and get that information on to, you know, to Jim for, for um, distribution. I can't say whether or not it's effective because it's not like there's like some sort of scientific study. You know, it's not like I've hired a bunch of thieves to say, hey, come try to get my mom's catalytic converter. But I can say it hasn't, you know, she hasn't had a problem yet. Yeah. Um, well, I think yep. if it slows them down, that helps deter them. They see yeah, that I, and they'll go on I, to the next one. Yeah, I don't think it's perfect, but I suspect it makes that sawzall activity a lot slower, in which case it goes from a minute to something a lot more than a minute, and then it's just not as big of a, not as easy anymore. The other thing I've been hearing about uh, recently is etchings. Um, I've seen police departments in various places holding um, free etchings of the catalytic converter mm -hmm. itself. Um, have you heard of those? Um, and whether or not those have been effective. I imagine it's gonna be kind of the same thing, similar as the, the paint, but a little bit more identifiable because they'll be able to trace it back to the vehicle that it was stolen from. Right, uh, you know, I haven't. I have um, the experience as far as like uh, folks that have a lot of tools. 
uh, engraving your uh, driver's license number on it. Uh, if we find uh, unique markings, we can run that that uh, driver's license number and uh, look uh, look up your information to be able to return the item to you. Uh, also, having those unique markings on it basically you create a serial number on the the object yeah. if you if you don't know the serial number if it doesn't come with one uh and then we can check the uh there's a a pawn shop database that we can look at and see uh if these items are pawned in, uh, in the area so it it uh it is um unfortunately it doesn't deter people but it does give us the ability if we're able to recover those items we will be able to contact the owner yeah. If that's a valuable enough component, has the police department considered uh, partnering with a local body shop to get those etchings done? Uh, because I, not everybody's going to have those tools, but if there was some sort of a community outreach event where people could drive their Prius up and get their cat converter etched, I mean, that could be a, a big deal. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a fantastic idea. Uh, like I say, we've been really focused on getting things up and running again with our volunteers, oh. but uh, I'm going to take note of that and and reach out to our uh, um, community services division uh, sergeant and see if if that would be a viable option. I, I love that, thank you. Sure. Okay. All right, I think that might be it for me if no one has any more questions. Uh, thanks for having me. It's, uh, it's good to see everybody again. So I have one more question. If you find okay. out information about this or mm -hmm. have in further information, how can we access this information? Uh, how so, will it uh, it, Jim, if I get that to you, uh, would you be able to disseminate it amongst everyone? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I think, you know, the new part, this, the new notification thing, if everybody signed up for it, it'll work good when we do an email. But <laughs> if they haven't, you know, and I don't know if I got mentioned at the beginning, but that new notification thing is a pain because you got to do a password and it rejected mm -hmm. my first two passwords. I thought were pretty good passwords. So it's, it's it, you got to be determined to get through the thing. And But you only have to do your password once and sign up for what you want. But that's normally how we disseminate information is through the email, but but I'll, I'll get it to you, okay? I'll, 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 we can we can disseminate information to board members, etc. And hopefully, I suggest you sign up for that notification, and then I'll just do it that way. Awesome, thank you. All right. Well, if no more questions, you uh, folks have a wonderful evening. Thank oh, you. Thank you very much. I'll continue on here. Um, uh, Kathy, I, I heard you on earlier. I can't see everybody on my phone, so I'm a little bit of a disadvantage, but do you want to go ahead and give the presentation for 12th and Hills Parks and Rec thing? I sure will. Hi, Jim. Hi, everyone. My name is Catherine Ellis again. I'm the representative from the Tualatin Hills Park and Recreation District. I have a couple of things to update you all on today. And um, everything that has a link in my presentation, I'll be putting in the chat as well so that you can grab it, peruse our website and find out more information at your leisure. But the number one thing we wanted to let everybody know is that our summer registration is now open. So Tualatin Hills will be back into the swing of summer camps. Um, that registration began on April 2nd. So activity guides are available online. You can also be coming into any Tualatin Hills open facility and researching and signing up for classes. Uh, with summer registration being open, we are also letting everybody know that THPRD hiring is underway. Um, we have lots of great opportunities, but we most specifically wanna call out the struggle we're having in our aquatics um, department right now. So our instructors and our lifeguards are experiencing a staffing shortage that's not just unique to Tualatin Hills or Beaverton or Oregon, it's a nation, nationwide shortage right now for that particular area. So we need people with aquatics experience. Um, help us spread the word if you know anybody. Um, we're really getting creative. We have started to offer pre-aquatics trainings. 
So again, if you go into the activity guides that I'm gonna put into the post, you're gonna be able to find all of the free um, lifeguard classes, junior guard classes, and swim instructor classes that we will be offering to our community in order to try to build that need and uh, that staff back up again. But outside of uh, summer registration, we wanted to let everyone know that our HMT trail work has been complete. So our staff has been resurfacing a lot of the soft surface trails in the North Forest area at our HMT complex, which of course is off of Walker and 158th with some hard packed gravel. So we're hoping that's gonna provide a drier experience for our trail users. And another exciting thing, we have our Nature Hills uh, Nature Park is now open to the public all seven days a week. So um, prior to the pandemic, it had been closed down, but we are now back open and uh, ready to invite everybody back into the nature center. Um, something close to home, Conestoga Recreation and Aquatic Center was closed down for six months, the pool side specifically for a remodel that has now been opened back up to the public. Um, some of the things that you're gonna see in there are new, uh, a whole new deck got poured, we have new ADA lifts, um, new paint, we have new ADA ceiling lights and new underwater lights. We also have uh, more changing room options. We got a new slide. There's now radiant floor heating. Um, and we also have on deck pool showers. So if you're someone who loves Conestoga or loves the pool, come check it out. Um, it's, it's ready for another 30 years. Um, the last thing we wanted to let everyone know, again, something that is going to be close to home uh, here with Greenway, is Tualatin Hills in Washington County were awarded Coronavirus State Fiscal Recovery Fund grant. And one of the things we're going to be doing with that is installing a total of three permanent public outdoor restrooms. And Tualatin Hills has selected three sites for that. Um, Hazeldahl Park, Schiffler Park, and one to go in at Greenway Park. So that's very exciting specifically for this community. Um, there will be some public engagement beginning this spring as we start to go through the planning and really the evaluation process of um, when those will be installed. So that's kind of the highlights for today. Um, I'll pause for any questions anyone might have and put more information in the chat. I'd like, I'm Joan, I'd like to, um, Let's see what I want to say. Um, I have been a long time swimmer and deep water aerobics participant at Conestoga, and I love having the pool back open. Oh, good. <laughs> and the deep water aerobics class on Monday and Wednesday is fantastic. Or we have a fantastic instructor. That's um, Marnie. <laughs> yeah. And we had over. We have between 30 and 40 people in the pool on Wednesday morning at a lot of good energy. And so I'm really glad it's back open. Well, Joan, we're so happy to have you back. We love hearing that. And, uh, you know, we actually took a picture of you all and sent it on to our management um, because we were so excited this week to see how many people were back and in the pool again. So thanks for that shout out. Um, I happy to have you back. <laughs> I thought I saw you when I saw your face. I thought you were the one that was taking the pictures, <laughs> walking around taking the pictures. <laughs> yeah. Um, James and then Wendy, I think. And sorry if I got that backwards. Let's let's have Wendy go first. I've I've talked to Blue Streak already today. Great. Wendy. Hi. Let me turn on. I I'm really actually there's a picture of me. See, I I'm really actually here. <laughs> Hi, Kathy. It's so nice to see you. Good to see you too. I was wondering if maybe the next meeting, if you could bring an update on a couple of the things that I know THPRD has been kind of working on. One is, what's the status of the of the crossing of on Schultz Ferry uh, for the Greenway uh, Trail? Um, you know, for the Fanner Creek Trail at Greenway, sorry. Um, what's the status of that? Because I think there is some movement on that, but I don't know what. Um, and secondly, could you give us an update kind of on what's going on at Cooper Mountain? There's a lot of stuff going on at Cooper Mountain that it's not immediately in our neighborhood, but it's a place that a lot of us go to. And mm -hmm. it would be nice to know what some of the updates are from what's going on there. Absolutely. Well, Wendy, of course, you know, we can get you in contact with Bruce Barbarash, who would have the most immediate information for both of those. But I'm happy to go ahead and do a little bit of research. And then when we meet up again, I'll specifically make sure we're highlighting that in the next recap. 
Well, I was just thinking everybody else might want to hear it too. So that'd be really Absolutely. cool. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's good to see you. Good to see you. Okay, James. Thank you. Uh, so just on a lark, I decided to bring up the Conestoga Rec Center on uh, mapping tool. Mm -hmm. And I can't help but notice that the rooftop is flat and bare. And I'll admit a certain bias. Whenever I see a, a flat, bare rooftop, I get a little cranky just because it feels like there should be something up there, like uh, solar panels or a community garden or something. And so I was just curious with all of the uh, renovation and stuff of that building, has there been any thought about what to do with that lovely open space on the top of the building? You know, I can't say immediately, James, that there's been talk about it. I do know that the district has um, done a lot of research into solar panels over the years. I can't really speak right now directly to why it is that we haven't leaned more into that. But again, I'll be very happy to bring some of that information back up next time. Um, and then as far as the garden area goes, I agree with you. I love seeing those, um, but a lot of it has to do with how much weight bearing we can actually put on the roof when it comes to more significant things like that. Um, but I'll do some research and bring that answer to you the next time we meet. I appreciate that, thank you. Of course. All right, without any further ado, Jim, I'll kick it back to you. Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much. And uh, Miles, is the fire service update going to start yet? They sent an email out to me and they were actually going to come to meet Zoom meetings anyway. And has that really started? I haven't really seen them yet. Okay, so that's good. We're a little bit behind schedule. I do have a clock in front of me now. And <clears throat> let's go on to the Metzger pipeline. East project. I think it's uh, the two people involved. Are they both here? And if so, can at least one of them start? Yep, they're here, Jim. Okay, it's yours. I'll let you introduce yourself and give your presentation. Great, thank you so much. Can everyone hear us okay? Yes. Good, thank you. Uh, Hi, my name is David Marciniak. I'm with the Willamette Water Supply Program. Uh, so we'll take a few minutes tonight to update you on our project. Uh, it's a drinking water pipeline or for the uh, Tualatin Valley Water District, City of Beaverton and City of Hillsboro. And I'm joined tonight uh, by my counterpart with City of Beaverton, Stacy. if you wanna introduce yourself. Hi, everybody. Good evening. Uh, Stacey Rive, City of Beaverton, Public Works Engineering, and I am the Public Outreach uh, Specialist for any of our major capital projects. So we get to coordinate with a lot of different jurisdictions, <laughs> including the Willamette Water Supply Program, Washington County, um, ODOT. And as you all know, there, there is a lot of construction that's going on in and around and through Beaverton. <laughs> So we thank you again for your patience. So um, David and Limit Water Supply Program has been great to work with. So I'll go ahead and let him start his presentation. Great. Uh, so we put a slide uh, show together here. We have some things going on that are very specific to the Greenway NAC. So thank you so much for having us. I'll go ahead and project that. Uh, hopefully it's showing up on your screens. If you can, anyone give me a thumbs up, looking good, thank you. Great. Uh, so I'll run through uh, some information here, give you a little uh, overview of our, our uh, water system too, for those of you that haven't heard too much about us. Um, so Willamette Water Supply uh, System is, is the water system we're building. Uh, so it, it, what happened was that uh, several decades ago, uh, multiple jurisdictions around the area were doing water resource planning, looking at their uh, long-term goals to meet service needs. And they all came to realization that they needed more water uh, to help these thriving communities. And in doing their studies separately, water districts do this typically, uh, their own studies, they all came to uh, similar realizations that the Willamette River and using uh, water credits that, that each agency has from the Willamette uh, was a viable cost-effective uh, way to go about getting that future water supply. Uh, so Tualatin Valley Water District, City of Hillsboro and City of Beaverton formed a partnership to build 
a uh, joint water system uh, to bring a new water resource into the area. Um, and it's a redundant supply for all those communities, uh, helps with emergency supply, emergency storage, and really one of the uh, true drivers as they're meeting that need for service uh, is to make this uh, the most earthquake resilient system in, in the state. And it'll be able to meet a lot of service goals if there is a, a event, a Cascadia subduction zone event would be a very large earthquake uh, that would impact the area heavily. Uh, this water system would be able to survive and uh, get water into the community, into the areas of needs uh, to help with uh, the recovery. Uh, so that was uh, the combined driver for the communities. And uh, here's a nice graphic that just kind of shows, you know, that Cascadia subduction zone and uh, how we're uh, really designing everything with that in the back of, of the mind uh, to make sure we build a hardy water system that'll be up and running uh, within, uh, you know, the same week of an event to, to get service back up to the communities. So briefly here, this is a project overview, uh, shows the water system, starts in Wilsonville. Uh, there's an existing water intake down there and we take the water up through Wilsonville by pipeline, mostly 66 uh, inch diameter pipeline. Uh, the pipeline that will be through the uh, Greenway Knack area is a 48 inch diameter pipeline. Um, and the pipeline makes its way up into the communities. There's a new water treatment plant uh, that will be uh, built in, in Sherwood, uh, state-of-the-art uh, filtration facility. Uh, and in total, it's more than 30 miles of that large diameter water pipeline. And then some water storage up on uh, Cooper Mountain as well, uh, that is critical um, to be stored at a high elevation so that during those emergency events, you don't have to rely on power. You can have that water able to feed down into the communities. So this is a nice uh, kind of schematic that just shows the, the enormity of this project. Um, some of you might be familiar with some of the work already going on for us in Strolls Ferry Road. Um, so you see a, a bunch of pictures here. The one in the top left in particular kind of shows how we work down a busy street that's got uh, you know business park nearby, sidewalk area, and then we're putting that pipeline in, in the street. So it takes up several lanes of traffic and you see the drawing that kind of shows how we, we plan that out. You know, so it's, it's, it's a sizable work area and it is mostly within uh, Shoals Ferry Road. Um, and then kind of walks you through, you see these bottom pictures digging a hole. It's typically an eight to 12 foot hole that we put this pipeline in uh, and install that and then uh, restore that back to the surface grade uh, in whatever area we are. Um, so it's quite a process um, and, and we keep it moving as quickly as we can, um, but it is big construction and, and important regionally for the community. So it does take some time to install a water system of this nature. I, I uh, spoke a little bit about the roots of the program going back decades in water resource planning. Uh, this kind of shows how that has evolved over the years. Um, you know, back in the early days, working up through some of our permitting, design and construction. And then the goal is to have this system uh, up and running in 2026, July of 2026. Overall, uh, we have work going on in a variety of areas. Uh, this shows our progress uh, for the total water system uh, down at the uh, Wilsonville area, these intake facilities. Uh, they're about halfway done with construction right now. Water treatment plant is just breaking ground, so uh, no construction progress there, but it's fully designed and all planned out. Uh, we have about 25% of our pipeline in the ground right now. Uh, some of you might be familiar with the Roy Rogers Road uh, widening that the county did. And what we did is we partnered with the county during that project to actually install our pipeline uh, while the roadway work was going on so that we could uh, get the work done more efficiently uh, as they were doing that construction. And then up on Cooper Mountain, those water storage tanks, uh, not quite broken ground, they're ju just starting up there. So 
Uh, they're, they're getting ready to be underway there. Big driver for us is local economy. Uh, we love demonstrating how we're giving back to the local economy and we, we track a lot of what we're doing in the community. Um, you know, we're a $1.6 billion water program. So we wanna make sure we're maximizing that money spent in our local community. And to date, uh, about 91% of, of what we've done uh, has stayed uh, within the local area. And, and we consider local anything within 50 miles of our project sites. So that's a significant uh, boon for the local economy and the regional economy as well. Uh, I'll go into some backstory on the Metzger Pipeline East itself and, and show you some specific work to the Greenway NAC now. Um, so this Metzger Pipeline East, this is the Eastern connection of the Willamette water supply system. So it's a very important function uh, to, uh, to uh, bring water into the city of Beaverton uh, and as well uh, serving as a connection point on the easternmost areas for the Tualatin Valley Water District. Uh, what happened was several years ago, they looked at different routes and uh, the, there was always a need for a Metzger pipeline for Tualatin Valley Water District. Um, but in addition, city of Beaverton had some water needs to install uh, some 16 inch diameter pipeline uh, for system redundancy to help tie their system together. Um, in addition to this Eastern extension that was needed for a new water service. Uh, so they looked at uh, combining the projects. It's a good way to reduce community impacts uh, by just having instead of concurrent construction projects one after the other after the next to treat them as one project and take a more holistic approach and combine them all into one construction area. So that uh, is how the Metzger Pipeline East evolved. Um, and here we have a, a picture that shows Everton's work uh, that's part of this partnership for putting in the water system. Uh, Stacy, I don't know if you want to take a minute there, kind of talk about the partnership and, and the Beaverton part of the water line. Sure. So as David mentioned, this is a combined project. So the B city of Beaverton has a 16 inch water line installation project that's going in simultaneously as the 48 inch water line from the Willamette Water Supply Program. So this does help obviously cost savings, a limit rework through combining construction. And it's always nice to not see a road ripped up twice, right? That's kind of how I look at it. So <laughs> that's nice. Um, and then one thing to kind of mention is I'm sure most of you are familiar with Western Avenue. So uh, the 1.1, so there are three different parts of the MPE or this Metzger Pipeline East project. There's a 1.1, a 1.2 and a 1.3. Uh, the 1.1, so 48 inch water line with the 16 inch water line is going along with our Western Avenue road work. So it's already a heavy lift doing the road work, but you know, combining different jurisdictions and coordinating with lots of different contractors, of course, that does make it even more complicated. But I feel like coordination effort has just been going really well and it's been seamless. So um, thanks to all the teams involved in that. Um, and then 1.2, again, that work um, is along Shoals Ferry, and that's where we're also working with uh, Willamette Water Supply Program. And then 1.3 actually continues on down to Roy Rogers. Yeah, so looking at those phases here, thank you, Stacy. Uh, this shows how that's broken up. So uh, really working from Western, that 1.1 phase on the north. And then the second phase is the middle portion, which goes uh, to Greenway Park. That's actually the dividing line between our second phase and our third phase. Um, and uh, then that third phase, taking that pipeline work uh, down to Roy Rogers Road, uh, where the pipeline's already installed and it connects into the, the new water system there. So in total, that's about 6.8 miles of the larger diameter 48 inch pipeline half a mile of 24 inch pipeline, uh, which is the Metzger connection portion, which is on Hall Boulevard, and then about 3.2 miles of that 16 inch uh, pipeline and several tunnels. Uh, so uh, to get under the waterways, Fano Creek, for example, uh, we tunnel under Fano Creek twice. 
as well as tunnels under Highway 217 and the West Railroad line. Uh, generally speaking, time frames, uh, the 1.1 is underway. That goes through uh, into 2023, uh, early 2023. The second phase uh, is underway now, um, and that goes till later in 2023. And then that third phase, the MPE 1.3, is uh, just been awarded, hasn't broken ground yet and that heads into uh, 2024. So lots of work going on uh, throughout the next several years there. Uh, the earliest work area we, we had was uh, to cross 217. So some of you that travel through this area uh, have probably seen multiple projects going on. So ODOT has a, uh, a, a project going on to enhance access and flow uh, through the area. But in addition to that, we're working with them in parallel uh, to install the pipeline. So the orange lines here are ODOT's work. And then you see our lines here. The yellow uh, is, is pipeline uh, we've installed or are currently installing. Uh, the solid lines are actually tunnel locations. So that gives you an idea of the tunnel locations to get under the roadways and, and highway. Um, and the yellow is the 48 inch. And then the red, since this is such a congested area, we actually sent the 16 inch up Cascade and then tunnel across the highway uh, towards the park and ride there. So that kind of gives you a snapshot of how we maneuvered through that challenging area. So most of this is, uh, is significantly done. There's a lot of work still to be done on Cascade, but a lot of this work up through the ramp area with the yellow line is complete. And they're currently in uh, Shoals Ferry Road near the park and ride installing pipeline. So now specific for uh, Greenway uh, Park area um, is the new work site. So what will be occurring down here is it's a uh, along Shoals Ferry Road. Uh, we've worked with THPRD. Uh, to acquire a work site. And uh, what that entails is a, a tunnel shaft. Uh, we needed a large area where we could create a tunnel to go under Fano Creek. Uh, so here you see the yellow that shows the tunnel itself. Uh, and then it comes up into the plaza area uh, where it will end. And then you see the blue pipeline, how we connect that through the area. Um, so in planning this, uh, we worked a lot with THBRD just to coordinate the logistics of that, uh, make sure we're minimizing impact to the trail, uh, finding a nice safe work site that we can, uh, you know, have a perimeter where we're not inconveniencing the public as much. Um, and this site will allow us to get our work done a lot more efficiently and safely uh, while also preserving the environment uh, since we'll be well outside of the wetland area and creek area. Uh, for that spot. So um, it, construction is slowly beginning. So if anyone's been out there, you've probably started to see some stakes. Um, so that is our work site being uh, kind of delineated. And then slowly over the next several weeks, you'll see an increase of inactivity uh, in this work site. Um, a couple of the uh, different impacts here shown in red are some of the bicycle lane, sidewalk, and traffic impacts that will be periodic in nature. Uh, so since we'll have the tunnel largely contained within the park area, um, what will happen is from time to time as they do the, the pipeline closer to the road, uh, then some of these impacts would be greater. When they're near the plaza on the other side of the tunnel, uh, there will be a period of time where they'll basically close down a lane of traffic just so they can get trucks in, in through the work site uh, without having to go into the plaza. Um, so those are some of the couple different traffic uh, bicycle lane uh, sidewalk impacts you'll see from time to time. Um, and uh, that'll be periodic in nature. Uh, access to the plaza will be maintained. 
And uh, access to the trails, for the most part, we don't anticipate impacting those trails that cross our work site. Uh, we have located the entrance of our work site just out off of the Shoals Ferry Road uh, trail inner, 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 inner tie there. Um, so even though we have, you see the orange box has the corner on the trail there, uh, we won't be entering or impacting the trail at that corner. Where we're, you would see a trail impact might be as they're installing the pipeline coming out of the park, uh, which will be at a future date, but that's, that's unknown at this time. Uh, and certainly we'll be uh, giving the public uh, several updates uh, as we get closer to some of those impacts there. So tunneling itself is about a seven month operation. And then in addition to that, we have the pipeline and then restoration, uh, which will be through November of 2024 in some capacity, sometimes a lot less work going on, uh, sometimes more. So uh, just real quickly, we appreciate your time. Uh, some more pictures here just to show the scope of the work. So on the left hand side, you see some pictures of what that typical tunnel operation kind of looked like. Big hole in the ground. Uh, it'll be about 28 feet deep in the park area. And uh, they'll uh, perform the tunneling down there. It's all very contained, so you don't really even know what's going on much. And then some activity above the ground with uh, some cranes lowering uh, materials and taking out materials as needed. And then on the right, you see a couple of our pipeline laying activities. Uh, so the upper one is them putting the pipe on the uh, ramp area, the off ramp um, for hi uh, Highway 217 to Shoals Ferry. And then the lower one is an aerial view of some of the night work that's been going on uh, in that area as well. So you can just kind of get a feel for the enormity of it and, and complexity of coordinating all this. Uh, real briefly, uh, just to kind of give you an idea, uh, our traffic setups vary through the area. We try to be in the middle of the road as we're working through the community. Uh, that way we can have uh, construction going in each direction around us. Um, so this kind of depicts our, our ideal setup, but we do need to go to either side of the road on occasion, uh, whether it's for uh, getting ready for a stream crossing like here at Fano Creek, uh, which you saw on the earlier map, um, or it might be to uh, just get the, the uh, pipeline to the other side of the road where there's yet less utility conflicts. Uh, so in situations like that, we, we send it off to the other side of the road and then kind of stack traffic on the opposite lanes, as you would see in this diagram there. Uh, to learn more about us, uh, we're pretty uh, active out there to educate people. Uh, enter a lot of our information on ODOT's trip, trip check tool. Um, so they have a very nice interface where we can enter our current construction impacts and any impacts to uh, traffic areas. Um, mm -hmm. And then that broadcasts to like Waze and Google Maps and some of those um, smart devices out there uh, that are becoming also common these days. Uh, we have a great partnership with City of Beaverton. There's a 1610 AM uh, is a City of Beaverton owned uh, frequency uh, to share general information and for emergency broadcast purposes. So we actually broadcast some information about the project and current traffic uh, impacts on there as well. Uh, and then individualized detour education. We just really like to go around to groups such as this, uh, to those neighbors that are most impacted. Uh, Stacy and I are, are constantly knocking on doors and, and meeting people just to explain it as we go and answer any questions that are out there. Uh, website we have set up, uh, people can visit is the uh, ourreliablewater.org forward slash MPE. That gets you to our main page. And uh, you can also uh, email us or call us. You see the, the information there. Uh, we're very active on Twitter as well. Uh, we send out a lot of traffic alerts through Twitter uh, and uh, YouTube as well. If anyone wants to catch up on, on some uh, good videos, uh, we have several uh, videos that are on YouTube uh, that talk about just the importance of the project uh, uh, 
to also talk about our progress uh, in addition to just interesting little uh, video clips of different work going on around the community. So with that, I, I'm sure you might have a few questions or, or maybe that was enough for you, um, but we'll, we'll have a large impact in the community for several years to come. And, and we look forward to uh, keeping you all updated as we uh, build our project through your neighborhood. Yeah, any questions? We yeah, have a few minutes. I just want to thank you for this information. This is wonderful. And it's a huge, huge project, like you said. And um, I like you combining it, the construction with other projects that are going on. Yep, absolutely. That's very important for us. We try to look for opportunities to combine wherever we can and we were fortunate here where we had a city of beaverton need uh, on multiple levels for their water line and their roadway in addition to uh partnering you know on, on other needs through the area so certainly well thank you yeah okay are there any other questions yes david okay. you at the beginning yeah. of your presentation Maybe I misunderstood because this is a huge project, obviously. Sure. But did I understand you to say that this system, at least to Beaverton, that it is a backup water system? Yeah, so it meets the future need uh, for all of the communities. So uh, and Stacy can expand a little bit, but City of Beaverton gets its water resources through multiple uh, sources. Um, and all of these communities, one of those common multiple sources is the Joint Water Commission, um, which is a very limited supply. Um, so this helps meet the need for those communities that need that extra water beyond their Joint Water Commission. Uh, current allotment um, and, and help have the redundancy meet the future need uh, as well as helping supply the resilient uh, water resource uh, for the communities. Okay, so, so it is considered uh, an auxiliary or backup plan at the present time once it's uh, fully completed. Yeah, I don't know, Stacy. you can expand on that a little bit as far as how it works into the water resource portfolio and... Um, <laughs> I would say, yeah, I could definitely do that. Um, but uh, to be honest with you, I'm still learning a lot about how that all kind of works together. Um, so I will, actually, I wrote that down. I said, oh, that's a kind of a good question. So I need to learn a little bit more about that but i can definitely email you ramona and get you a good answer thank you mm -hmm. yeah that that's a complex subject so we really don't have time to go into it tonight so you Jim, i had a question okay sorry my hand's up but i don't know if you saw it uh this is wendy <laughs> i see it after somebody selects you but i can't <laughs> see the, i can't see the group at all as a whole Okay. With just my phone. Okay. Um, I first of all, I want to thank both David and Stacy for uh, a lot of good information. Um, I live fairly close to 217 and Shoals Ferry, and uh, I've been very interested in uh, you know it's almost you can't get there from here on some days because I can't get out of many ways. I usually get out of my uh, neighborhood, so it's it's been kind of interesting. Um, I did have a couple of questions, if I may. One is you mentioned, I think you called them supply tanks, the water tanks, and you had sure. mentioned Cooper Mountain. And are you planning on putting any, any place else besides Cooper Mountain? Um, no, we aren't. That's the primary area uh, for the storage. Okay, thank you. And um, I just also wondered about work hours. Um, I haven't heard a lot of noise at night, which I really appreciate. Um, but but being as Greenway Park is a natural area, there are a lot of critters that kind of need the night to be quiet and not lit as much as possible. So I was wondering what plans you had in place for taking care of that. 
I, I appreciate that question. Um, so work hours, I can, I'll have to see what the specific work hours for the Greenway Park activities might be. Um, I haven't heard yet, um, but our work hours do vary um, because of the, the road work. A lot of the intersections uh, are technically, logistically are hard to get through an intersection with the massive amount of traffic. So we tend to try to do night work when we have uh, situations where we need to impact traffic less. Um, so each work area is a little bit different. Um, Hall Boulevard, for example, that'll be mostly a night work area because um, we know that by having that done at night, it's gonna just help alleviate some of the traffic concern uh, on the roadway and have less of an impact to those business neighbors we have there. Um, yeah, as far as the park, I know on the one side at the business plaza, we will have some restricted hours over there uh, to a certain extent, um, but I'll check and I can get a little better information on, on what the hours for the actual park uh, footprint of the site will be. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, anyone else? Because we are running out of time. We really need to get on. <clears throat> well, thank you, David. And thank you. Well, I suspect we'll have more questions as the work progresses and it gets noisier and more yes. traffic impacts, etc. So, anyway, nice to have, nice to hear your thing, and I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions later on. Okay, and let's let's go on. Uh, the next, oh, it's uh, you, Miles. The city update. And obviously, we need to keep it fairly short, so it's yeah. up to you. Um, before we get started, Kevin uh, Palat is here. He's your code service representative. He just wanted a minute or two to speak, and then I'll do the quick update. Hey, thank you, Miles. Hey, I just wanted to let everybody know with spring around the corner, um, a lot of home improvement projects are coming up. Uh, please remember to put uh, bark dust, rock, uh, building materials, any of that stuff. Please try to put it in your driveways. Um, if you can't, um, please try to let us know ahead of time so we're not getting calls about the roads being blocked. It's been kind of a big issue. Um, basketball hoops in the street. Also, if you have basketball hoops and kids play on them, that's awesome. We love to see that. Please make sure the basketball hoops come out of the street in, after use. Uh, if they go into the planter strip, uh, that's fine. We're not, we're, not, uh, we're not worried about that as long as they're not blocking sidewalks or roadway uh, for emergency vehicles and ADA access. Um, I think that's most of what I had. Uh, please remember to trim your bushes and your trees so sidewalks and, and roadways are clear. Um, and I believe that's about everything we have going on in the Greenway area at this moment. Um, if you do yard work improvements, uh, large areas of yard, uh, try to get, please contact the city so we can get uh, permits in place for that. We've been having a lot of uh, unpermitted work in the Greenway area recently. Um, site development has been um, working with us to get those permitted and, and handled, but uh, they are popping up. So if you have any questions, I'm available really quick. I've got a quick question. Uh, what's, what is the nature of most of the unpermitted work, just in case uh, it's like, just to know what to look out for? Um, we've had several different types. Um, there've been a couple where uh, people have replaced sidewalk um, and, and added additions to their driveways. Uh, per, private property is not something we're super concerned about, but it is something that needs to get permitted. But, but if you're doing any work in the right of way, like sidewalks or taking down trees and the planter strips, those need to be permitted or at least talk to um, the permitting office or the uh, city arborist for, especially when we're coming uh, regarding trees. Um, and then there have been fewer uh, people have decided to re-landscape and they've done large areas like their entire front and backyard at the same time, which is totally okay. We just need it permitted for, um, make sure it has proper erosion control and um, soil uh, disturbance uh, measures. Uh, does, does this include retaining walls? Because I need to redo it. I'm gonna redo a retaining wall. If you're redoing it and you're not adding any height to it or anything like that, Jim, I think you're okay there. Um, if you want us to come take a look at it, obviously just give us a call. We'll come out and take a look and just say, hey, yeah, you're good. Or, you know, is this something you might want to look into? But yeah, we're happy to take, take, a, take a look at it. 
But if okay. you wanted to do something like remove a lawn and put in raised beds, that might be uh, something to have someone come out. You're you you can have us come out. You should be okay if it's a small area. If it's uh, below, I think it's uh, two hundred square feet. Uh, okay. So you should be okay if you if you're operating within your yard and doing yard improvements. That's okay. We don't have a, we're not too worried about that. Um, but just as long as you maintain kind of soil and erosion control. So as long as it's not. If, if there were to be a rainstorm and there's not soil running over the sidewalk and down into the, the storm drains. Got it. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Any other questions, comments? All right, Miles, it's your show. Okay, I'll be real quick. Um, this is the city news. We've got April 22nd. April 2022 is Arbor Month in Beaverton. Um, there was a proclamation recognizing the importance of trees and parks and the encouragement of tree plantings and care throughout Beaverton. The city maintains nearly 40,000 trees to enhance the community of beauty and improve the quality of our neighborhood. Beaverton has been recognized for 28 years as a tree city USA by the National Arbor Foundation. Um, and this year, the city will receive a growth award for the 18th year. You can learn more about Beaverton Trees at beavertonoregon.gov slash trees. Our new website just went live this week. It's redesigned and should improve the user experience for the nearly 1 million annual visits to the site. The site will better highlight timely and relevant information for community members, and the navigation is intuitive and user-friendly. And you should check out the new website at beavertonoregon.gov. And then finally, I think Ramona's going to talk about this in a minute, but just a reminder, the Beaverton Voters Forum is April 28th. You can join community members for an evening with the candidates running to represent you. Um, we're going to have candidates for Beaverton City Council positions one, two, three, and five. And the forum is Thursday, April 28th, 6.30 to 8 p.m. at the Patricia Research Center for the Arts. And you need to, uh, tickets are free, but you do need to get a ticket from the research or from viewersinoregon.gov slash voters forum. Those are all the updates I have, Jim. Okay, that's fine. And I understand that research changed the rules. So instead of having to be just vaccinated, all you need is a mask to get in. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah, which makes it a little bit simple. Okay, let's go fast here. The, there are no local land use issues other than tearing up 217 and Chills Ferry and all that, but those have all been talk, spoke about. Uh, are there any neighborhood concerns or visitor comments that somebody would like to bring to the attention of the Neighborhood Association? Wendy has her hand raised. Who has? Wendy. Yeah. Oh, okay. I can't Thank see, you. at least on the phone, I can't see everybody, so. Uh, if there is a way, I don't know what it is. So. Well, I had two. I had two questions um, uh, that have to do with city uh, things, and I wasn't sure whether um, there was already a plan in place to talk about them at some point. Um, one is fireworks, and I believe the city is having um, a work session with the council at some point about fireworks, but I don't know the details. Because um, we were very concerned last summer with the heat and, you know, the wind and all the things that we had. And we had asked at that time that the city take a look at um, either potentially fully banning or trading off or doing something about fireworks because a lot of people get really upset with them, uh, both for pets, uh, for veterans. There are a lot of reasons to be upset about them. So if there's anything going on with the city, it would be really great to have kind of a heads up of what's going on. Wendy, April... April 26th, City Council is going to meet to talk specifically about fireworks. Great. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, that's super. Um, the other question I had is, um, it's the um, housing options process or project. And I know that the, that the City Council is probably going to be talking about that at some point too, but that's the one I think we all got notices that basically our R7s are going to be no more. And uh, and the way I read the rules um, that are being proposed, uh, somebody could put up a fourplex about a foot and a half from my property line. So I'm not real excited about that. And I'm pretty sure that a lot of other people wouldn't be excited about it either, but I don't know if they know about that. So I was wondering if there was gonna be any kind of discussion or presentation to the NACs about what um, the upcoming plans are. 
I know that they presented to BCCI. I don't know that they're going out to all the neighborhoods. Um, yeah, I think uh, I, you know, they presented to city council just a week, a couple of weeks ago, right? They had or a, a presentation. The rules are sort of draft mode now. And I think they need to go on. I'm on the sort of the citizens advisory committee, but, but we're pretty much done with our work. It's it's up higher levels now. And well, it's higher level, but Jim, I'll tell you what, when I talk to my neighbors and they find out that they're not gonna have the same zoning yeah. and they're gonna, you know, they're not happy. So I don't know what's gonna happen when this suddenly explodes. Yeah, well, I'm not too happy either. And I don't like the lack of parking, some other right. things right. That, that are going to, I can present that at a presentation. I, I can probably get somebody that knows to talk to us about it. So I'll, I'll see how that goes. Okay. okay I'll, I'll, you know, I don't know what their timeline is for getting all this done. So I'll check. You know, some of this is dictated by the state. So you know, no matter what we want to do, we can't say we aren't going to do it, or the city is not going to say we aren't going to do it because the state's going to make us. Jim, that's a sand, that's a real handy argument, uh, and I understand the rules exactly from the state. However, I think there are different ways of doing this than what's being proposed, and I think that some of us who have gardens, uh, for example, we're not going to be real excited to have a fourplex all around us for a lot of reasons. Well, I agree. Uh, probably the only consolation is all this will never happen in our lifetimes. But I mean, <laughs> you know, I, I, you know, judging from how slow they want. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk to, to the person that's in charge of this, right, and see if he'll do a Zoom presentation at a future NAC meeting. You know, when you hear it, when you hear it presented the way they present it, you don't think it's so bad, but when you really look at it, it's bad. It's pretty bad. <laughs> yep. Thank you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> let's, uh, BCCI, do you have a report, uh, Ramona? Uh, if it is, keep it pretty short. Well, mainly, I was going to say that uh, the mayor gave the state of the city uh, address on March 29th, and I think that's a recording that can still be viewed. Is that correct, Miles? Okay. And then the the deal with the city's new website, which all the trouble we had tonight getting our NAC, NAC meeting started, I was attributing to the update or the upgrade. Maybe that has nothing to do with it, but uh, I had lots of difficulty getting on and I was amazed that I finally did. And I am concerned now about notifications being sent to me because I have multiple different committees that, that I want to be notified of and I cannot make the change. The city is or the system is saying that my uh, password does not agree with my email name and I've never had a password with the city so I don't know what the heck to do and I'm sure I'm not the only one in that boat so that's a, a major concern as far as notification and um, the only other thing I had was the voters forum that you've already announced so that's it for the BCCI report yeah you know, Ramona, once you get past the password part of it, which I spent a lot of time on that too. I don't have a password. I never had a password with the city. So you have to generate a new one. But once you get on there, you can select all the various things you want to get notifications from at one time. So it, it's not it's not that bad a deal. But it, you know, people are going to get stopped at the password and just give up. You know, I think it's really and it's also the fact that the old notifications are done, right? They aren't going to yeah. move them. They're, not, they're just going to stop. So I'm not very impressed with that. OK, um, I'm going to skip the old business, Greenway NAC for potential projects for 2022. We're going to talk about the uh, adopt the road in the next uh, new business. So 
First, uh, James Twilliker wants to be um, the alternate BCCI rep. I'm that, but I'm perfectly willing to let him come in. I think it's time we bring some new, uh, younger, more enthusiastic people into it. And I've been looking for this for quite a while. So I, what I would like to just take a vote, and I'm not gonna be able to count very well, maybe somebody else can. Uh, what I would like to do, propose is that we basically uh, elect uh, James to Whitaker for uh, alternate uh, BCDI rep. So do I have a second for that? Do you have a, do you have a quorum? I don't know. I can't see it. <laughs> I'm on my phone, my, my, my PC, you know, and I got two PCs and one's a Chromebook, but, and they both can't hook up to the, the Zoom website. So I don't know. You have, you have five board members here right now. Oh, that, okay. that'll, do, that'll do it. We only have uh, 12 uh, board members total and it's 30% or something like that. So we're, we're, we're four at four, we're fine. We got five, we're fine. So, okay. so basically I made the proposal that we elect Jim. Uh, I need a second. This is Wendy, I second, I second it. it. This is, this is, this is, this is something I'm all for. I think it's a good idea. So, you know. I, I appreciate you got your that. Second. I, I, I didn't know actually that I was displacing you, Jim. I was told that it was vacant, and now I'm well, feeling no, no, weird. They displaced me for a long time. You, you, get, <laughs> okay. you, you get eighty, you get thrown away. So, but but that's fine. I you know I'm things to change a little bit, and and I'm perfectly willing to do this. So okay, no, no, I, I appreciate that. I, I, I just wanted you to know, I, I, I didn't actually know that you were filling that role. I, I was told it was vacant, so I am well, just so you know. I don't know where they came up with that opinion, but, but I think it's a good idea. I really do. Okay. You know, if we don't bring the younger people in and start building up, you know, at least middle-aged people, our knack's going to just disappear. Well, I appreciate so, being called a younger person. It's, it's a good yeah. change of pace. Well, you're younger than I am. Let's put it that way. So, anyway, um, any discussion on this proposal? Okay. All those in favor, raise your hand. And somebody tell me how many that is. Okay, I can't see everybody, so somebody has four. to tell me. <laughs> I four. see four. <laughs> okay, and. Okay, and therefore it's going to, there's only five quorums, so, you know, all those opposed can say nay or abstain, but what four wins, so that's, that's a done deal, and you will be <clears throat> notified by uh, Lanny tomorrow, as, you know, for the new meeting and everything. That's I appreciate that, Jim. Thank you so much. Very yeah. grateful. I look forward to serving. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Of course, again, uh, we also have an unfilled uh, vice chair. I mean, would you be interested in that? I mean, you I, can be. You can. I, I actually would not mind if you if it's unfilled and if it's a role that would do some help. I would not mind it. Well, well, you saw what happened the night when I couldn't get on. I mean, you know, and I'm getting up there. Yeah, I would like to really rec recommend you. And we have a quorum, which we don't always have, even at election time. So, you know, I would like to um, put it this way, and and we have the we, we can outside of elections call us have a special election. So I would like to nominate you as chair as vice chair, which right now is an unfilled position. Okay, and, I'm willing to serve. And and do we have a second? I'll second. Okay, so all those in favor, raise your hand. I can't see from my standpoint, but I want to assume there's at least four hands raised. There are. There are. Okay. So uh, Jim is 
our new vice chair. I think that's really a good idea to get a vice chair. I did, you know, I haven't missed a meeting for ages and ages, but I have more and more things that could take me away, you know, health issues, et cetera. So totally. is, I, I'm, I'm flattered and I'm very grateful, Jim. Thank you. Okay. Of course, you realize eventually I'm going to suggest you take over being chair, but, you know, <laughs> One step, little one step at a time. Yeah, one step at a time. I thought, I thought that was too much for now. Okay, <laughs> the other thing we need to do is discuss our adopt a road cleanup, which we were talking about the twenty third, which is also solve cleanup day and all that. But that doesn't bother us. So, one question is, do we have four people that will volunteer? You know, that that's important. I didn't. I didn't check the website to see if that date is available, but I don't think it's a problem. April twenty so, third is that what you're talking, Jim? Yeah, that's this, much that, that's this coming Saturday. Right. Whoops. Are you still there? Yes. Okay, just a second. I. Don't, uh, I'm not, Bob, are you available? Yeah, for road cleanup. Okay. So I missed some of that. I, I knocked my phone over. Um, so do, do we have four people? Well, Bob and I can can help on Saturday. That's two. We don't have anybody else, right? I don't know. Where are our other voters that were voting a while ago? If it were a little bit further out, I, that's the, exactly the kind of thing I'd love to help out with. But unfortunately, this weekend I'm I'm finishing off my uh, move from Redmond to Beaverton. Oh, <clears throat> well, I don't know. Maybe it is. I it's really unfortunate I can't see, and I this is really a strange failure on the way it's failed because I've used two different computers and my phone would not work on going through the internet, but it did through the cell service. So there's, I'll go down and reset my router and everything after. The it's meeting. not your router, Jim. It, it happened to at least two others of us. I'm, I had the exact same thing happen to me. Oh, okay. okay. Let's, well, with only two volunteers, you know, I'm, I'm hesitant uh, if you really want, let me let me check tomorrow, okay? It's Ramona. I'm not going to send a message. I was going to send a message out on notifications, but I don't think that's going to do any good right now. And but I can check tomorrow. I, I'll check with uh, uh, Ann Franey and uh, I can't think of the other person's name. Cindy. Huh? Cindy. Yeah, if they can do it, then we're fine, okay? Well, she's okay. right here online now. Uh, Cindy, can you help? At least her name is appearing. And there's Joan. Joan has an... That's me. I have an injured hand and arm, so I don't know okay. with one if I could no. just do it one handed. No. Nope. Otherwise, normally I'm available to help with okay. things like that. That's OK. How about you, Cindy? Can you assist this Saturday? Not, not there. Okay. Nothing. I'll check with her via email. I mean, is this something that happens more than once a year? Yeah, yes, it's to supposed to happen four times a year. Okay. Cindy, right. Cindy is not available this Saturday. She just is unable to um, talk right now. Oh, okay. As well, personal could, secretary. Could, could we shove it back to the 30th, Jim? Yeah, I can check that. Well, let's, let's tentatively go on the 30th. We've had such lousy days weather-wise, and this Saturday looked good as far as I could see. So, but yeah, <laughs> let's let's go with the thirtieth. We haven't had much time for advertising it, and I'll send emails out to the 
people that have helped in the past of that. Okay. Or, you know, if I get some of this other information I'm supposed to get to help people, you know, that the people have said they're going to send, then I'll do it. Anyway, let's do, I'll, I'll check on the 30th and let's go ahead and adjourn the meeting, okay? Okay. Any, any problems with that? Then the meeting is officially adjourned, okay? Okay.